Greetings and welcome back to Room 303 and our chats with Emily as we are calling our readings through the poetry of Emily Dickinson contained in the Johnson edition. We turn out a poem, 175, I <clears throat> Have Never Seen Volcanoes. Now, this is one of the more complicated and complex poems that we have studied up to this point. Um, here, in some ways, Emily will meet Marcus Aurelius. A whole lot of ink has been spilled on this idea that Emily's Puritan roots are primarily stoic in nature, and we're going to see that game played out here. Again, we got the question of the Odyssey, the question of pain and suffering in the world. Um, she calls it a pain titanic. Now, our assumptions are that you've been following our stuff at LearnStrong.net, down that left-hand side, chats with Emily, our playlist. I'm hopeful that you've already been introduced to our set of introductory comments, as I just mentioned, our big five, the last being the Odyssey question. I'm hopeful as well that you've already read the previous 174 poems we just finished with at last Uve Identified. It is important, I think, that you embed this study of this poem with all of the poetry that has come before and quite a few of the poems to follow, and we'll be reading one or two of those. Now, structurally, interestingly, the poem is actually really just one long sentence. If you, if, if when we read it, you'll see it. Um, it is, however, complicated because of this notion of the volcano, which for Emily will serve as representative symbolic of both love as well as rage. They will uh, go back and forth, and, and her referencing here to Vesuvius and to Pompeii will matter for us. Now, there's been a lot made of Sam Boyles as it relates specifically to this poem. She, he called Emily in a letter to, his, uh, to her niece once that, about Emily saying Emily was half angel, half demon. Um, and there's good reasons probably for that in our study of the, of, of the letters especially. In some ways it's possible that the scholar Ruth Miller is right and that this poem may be referring to an article that Sam Boyles wrote in the Springfield Republican um, in which he said the following. Now it's possible that Emily took what he was saying here about her and her poetry. He, uh, uh, um, Boyle said it this way, quote, the writers of what may be called the literature of misery are chiefly women. Gifted women may be full of thought and feeling and fancy, but poor, lonely, and unhappy. The lacerated bosom must first be healed before it can gladden other natures with the overflowings of a healthful life. Now, uh, it is true that Emily will talk about herself as a Pompeii buried by Vesuvius uh, in the second master letter, actually, uh, um, that was intended for Sam Boyles, that's letter uh, to three. And in some ways, it's possible that Emily in this poem may be responding to this idea that she's going to have to wait until the resurrection. That is to say, until people finally discover her stuff before it's clear how powerful the volcano was. She says it this way. I've never seen volcanoes, but when travelers tell how those old phalagmit mountains, uh, usually so still, bear within appalling ordnance, fire and smoke and gun, taking villages for breakfast and appalling men, if the stillness is volcano in the human face, when upon a pain titanic features keep their place, if at length the smoldering anguish will not overcome, and the palpitating vineyard in the dust be thrown, as some loving antiquary on resumption morn will not cry with joy, Pompeii to the hills return. Now, we begin with referencing poem 80 and poem 124 with I've never seen. You'll remember in poem 124 in lands I never saw. In other words, she's never been to Italy. She's never been to see um, uh, uh, Pompeii and Vesuvius, the, the, the surrounding area of Vesuvius. She says, I've never seen volcanoes. And right away, there's a couple of poems that we will study later that will take, uh, that will help us out. Poem 1705, she will say it uh, this way in poem 1705. Volcanoes be in Sicily and South America, I judge from my geography. Volcanoes nearer here a lava step at any time. Am I inclined to climb a crater I may contemplate Vesuvius at home? And then in poem 1748, just a few poems later, she'll say it this way, the reticent volcano keeps his never slumbering plan confided are his projects pink to no precarious 
man. Um, this is the, the, both of these poems. We'll come back to this one. I've never seen volcanoes, but when travelers tell, this is again back to that reporting. I think she borrows some of this from Shelley's Ozymandias. I met a traveler from an antique land who said, "Two vast and trunkless legs of stone." Blah blah blah. We've given full lectures on the poem at LearnStrong.net. I've never seen volcanoes, but when travelers tell how those old phlegmatic, uh, only use of that words, right, like the, the mountains that spit, right, uh, mountains usually so still, I've commented on the fact that I think T.S. Eliot learned to use the word still from uh, his study of Emily Dickinson. Eliot saying we must be still and still moving into another intensity. Usually so still, the, the, the volcanoes bear within. Now, we're going to go here from old to antiquary in a little bit. We're going to go from still to stillness here in a little bit. Bear within, we're going to go from that to keep their place in a little bit. In other words, people can be like volcanoes, where they look like nothing is going on. Their face, bear within. And then notice our use of the word appalling. First is adjective, then is verb. Appalling ordinance, fire and smoke and gun. Poem 118 will remind us of her use of the word gun. Taking villages for breakfast, think about the power of the idea of Beowulf's dragon. Taking villages for breakfast and appalling men. Again, uh, the, the rhyming here is interesting between gun and men. And then we got three ifs. If the stillness is volcanic, and then all of a sudden we realize, oh, I get it. She's moving from talking about Vesuvius to talking about herself or others who appear to be very, very still and calm but buried beneath, right? If the stillness is volcanic in the human face, you'll remember this one from poem 170, Face. When upon a pain Titanic, she'll only use Titanic one other time in 593, Titanic opera, features keep their place. So notice we go from bear within to keep their place and then will not overcome. If at length the smoldering Anguish. Now, this is again this idea of stoicism from Marcus Aurelius, of smoldering anguish. In poem 1532, she'll play this game with the word smoldering. It's, it, it is compelling the way she says it. Um, in poem 1532, she says it this way um, <clears throat> She says, uh, From all the jails, the boys and girls ecstatically leap. Beloved, only afternoon that prison doesn't keep. Um, I find this I, I find this a compelling way to think about the notion of it's it's brewing, it's brewing, smoldering, smoldering, and the palpitating vineyard in the dust be thrown. In other words, what happens when it finally explodes? If some notice, it's loving antiquary. Only time she uses this word antiquary on resumption mourn will not cry with joy, again, back to loving, Pompeii, by the way, remember joy uh, um, from poem 172. Um, you'll remember also that we'll see in poem number 58 and then 42 other mentions of this word joy. Pompeii is only used once in her poetry and it's here. To the hills return. Well, how are we gonna, how are we gonna actually understand a poem like this? I think the argument she's making is sometimes it's hard to live that stoic existence, that calm demeanor, to keep those emotions within. And especially if one, like Emily, is worried that somebody like Sam Bowles cannot really understand her poetic genius. There's calm, 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 but oh, it's altogether possible that something will explode. And if it does, the question is, can I come back from it? That is to say, return. Is there any capability of, uh, of you know, resurrection at, at the end of it all? At 2B, I love her word choice here. At 3A, well, obviously we, we cannot read a poem like this without thinking of Frost's Fire and Ice. But I want to gesture towards some poems that will be coming. When we meet a poem 1410 um, here, here in our study, um, we're going to enjoy this one. I shall not murmur if at last the ones I love below permission have to understand for what I shunned them so divulging it would rest my heart but it would ravage theirs. Why, Katie, treason has a voice but mine dispels in tears. Or uh, poem 601, when we get there, we'll read, uh, we'll read this way. 
um, she'll say it this way, a still volcano life that flickered in the night when it was dark enough to do without erasing sight, a quiet earthquake style too subtle to suspect by nature's this side Naples, the north cannot detect, the solemn, torrid, symbol, the lips that never lie, whose hissing corals part and shut and cities ooze away. And finally, poem 1677, when we meet this poem, we're going to enjoy this one as well. She says it this way, On my volcano grows the grass, a meditative spot, an acre for a bird to choose, would be the general thought, how red the fire rocks below, how insecure the sod that I disclose would populate with awe my solitude. Finally, at 3B, uh, to own a poem like this, how, how do you live with volcanic, with titanic pain? And is Emily teaching you anything about how to deal with those challenges? I hope so. Thank you.